I want to give you some a scoop which I haven't I haven't publicized yet. Uh, we have two people inside the inside UNRWA. Every time there's a there's an altercation, they say this is the amount of children killed, the amount of people killed, and what they're getting ready to do will be to put out an album of all the kids who've been killed. And of course, we're the only ones who can show that they were armed ahead of time, and there's no one more important than the kids on the on the, on the front line. Welcome back to Right Side In. I'm your host, Jeffrey Ben Zane. Thank you so much for joining us. I trust that everything is well on your side of God's green earth. We have a pretty amazing podcast lined up for today. I had the opportunity to sit down with Israeli investigative journalist and author, Mr. David Bedin, director of the Nahum Bedin Center, as well as IsraelBehindTheNews.com. David provides his expert analysis on the ongoing war in Gaza how the war was completely avoidable, and certainly no surprise to anyone mildly paying attention. We talk about the double standard at the UN when it comes to handling the Palestinian refugees versus everywhere else in the world. We also talk about Biden's ridiculous, over-the-top executive order targeting Jewish residents in Judea and Samaria. And we also discuss how Israel simply cannot afford to allow Palestinian workers back into the country for work. This is due to incentivized murder from the Palestinian Authority, otherwise known as pay for slay. We get into that as well. And last but not least, David reveals the next round of propaganda that's headed to a channel near you for the purpose yet again to accuse Israel of genocide. Remember, we are viewer supported, so please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video with everybody you know. Also, don't forget to join us over at americansagainstatesolution.org, and you can also find us on X. You're not going to want to miss the content that we've got coming out in the very near future. So don't forget to hit that notification button uh, so you are the first to know when that new content drops. So with that said, enjoy, stay tuned. Here's Mr. Bedin. You know, the, the attacks on October 7th were, of course, portrayed in the media as, you know, being something random or spontaneous, and and there's no way anybody saw it coming, but the truth is the exact I did. opposite, of course. I, I saw it coming. <laughs> but the problem is when you say imminent for 10 years, people look the other way. But the, the, it, it, the movies, you see the children going through exercises with guns. And by the way, I want to give you something, a scoop which I haven't, I haven't publicized yet. Uh, we have two people inside, the, inside UNRWA, uh, an Israeli and an Arab. The Israeli is a, a guy who works for foreign press inside, and the Arab is a journalist. And their next step in propaganda is they're doing a full survey of all the children who have been killed. And uh, as you know from my movies, my movies, we show armed children. And when Israel goes, every time there's, a, there's an altercation, they say this is the amount of children killed, the amount of people killed. And what they're getting ready to do will be to put out an album, a, fo- a photo exhibit of, of all the kids who have been killed. And of course, we're the only ones who can show that they were armed ahead of time. And they're, they're essentially, basically, the, the um, the uh, there's no one more important than the kids on the on the on the front line. And my first article I wrote about this current situation, which my friends asked me to censor, self censor, is the the avoidable war. Uh, because everything was avoidable if they just, you know, ten days before on September 27, we met with top people in Israeli intelligence and said, look, just get rid of the, take the take the um, guns out of UNRWA. We'll solve half the problem. Right, listening to me. Well, I have four four veterans of Israeli intelligence who know Arabic like the back of their hands, including the guy who 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 has gone through one thousand school books of the PA. You know, it's it's very effective. Pre October uh, October seven, what it would look what it looked like the the kids were training to do to do this, and it's one thing to say that the thing it couldn't have been spontaneous, it's another thing to show it. And uh, that's the most important thing. And we, I mean, I assume you've seen my movies. And you take one at a time, and whatever you have. I have a movie called "Children's Ar- the Children's Army of Hamas." I have another one, "Onra Goes to War." I have another one called uh, "Camp Jihad." Another one called "Inside the Palestinian in, Inside the Onra Classroom." 
Uh, you know, those are these these movies speak for themselves. They're very matter of fact. And the most important thing to emphasize is that they, they it shows the total total preparation and the um, matter of factness of of, of of preparing people for work. And the big difference, I've had four different Holocaust scholars in the office to look at our material, to look at our school books. We have all 1,000 school books from the PA, and um, all four of them said the same thing. The Nazis never had anything like this. The Nazis never had a, had a, a, um, a school book or a film, I mean, the films were, which were for afterward, but never had a film being proud of the fact that they, that they killed Jews. When picture, I mean, the, 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 the unique picture of Dalala Mugrabi, a woman who murdered to, to 36 Jews, they didn't have anything like that. But they, 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 because they, they, they were always afraid there was going to be recriminations. Here, there's no fear whatsoever. Very important. This, but you know, the combatants are how old? What's the average age of the dead Chabas fighter? 14. You know what it is? That's right. Somehow is you it? know that. Yep. And we're going to pay for that because right now the the Gaza Mental Health uh, Health Ministry is there was a, a film survey of every child who was killed by the IDF. And we're going to be uh, accused of in, 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 inventicide or whatever that word is very soon. And we're not ready for it. Well, then you know it might not be a complete and utter lie when they say that a majority of the Palest Palestinians killed are women and children. I guess when you're putting automatic weapons in their hands, then it makes sense. That's right. So obviously you have insiders, right, that are that are able to do the interviews uh, Arab, in the camps. Arab journalists. Arab journalists, sure. So once once the uh, you know once the footage is published, how how is it that you that you continue to have the ability to you do that? You understand the Arab mentality. They are making them their 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 refugee camps famous. They're very proud of what they're doing. Arafat was once asked about me because Perez tried to say we were we were doctoring the films. He says, no, no, I appreciate David Bedin. I like what he does because everyone will know what I say to my own people. It's counterintuitive to what you think. You think in terms of public relations. That's not how they think. I spell their name right and I show them good and I pay them. Hmm. When they come back from a shoot, the, the people in the village say, did he pay you? Did he pay you well? That's all I care about. It's time to hear to give the opportunity for the Arabs to speak for themselves. And the strongest movie, which is relevant for right now, is The Unrush Child Soldier 2021. That I put it out in four languages, and it, it speaks for itself. And those are the children that we're right now killing on the front line. And you'll see there, Messier Snapish, if you want to call it that. The kids at the end of the movie, we interview all the, all the children. We interview about 25 children. So why are they there? They're there in order to fight for right of return. When you watch the the clear evidence of these children being trained from such a young age what what do you think the outcry would be from the media you know if we uh flip the script if they, what if what if, if it was israeli yeah. summer camps that were teaching youth how to use automatic weapons and, and kill arabs that that direction is a lost case um i've been i've been at this game for 37 years you're not gonna you pull one off like, like this on the uh, mainstream media. I used to be part, when I opened up the office, we were retained by the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and uh, Wash and uh, New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and, a and NBC TV. We were giving them regular material because they didn't know, everyone was understaffed when the Intifada began. So we, they retained us to give them good material. I mean, there was not a, a, um, uh, something against the and, and a, uh, a bias against the mainstream media at the time. Earlier, you mentioned the article that uh, that you recently published with the with the New yeah. York Post, and mm -hmm. in, in that in your recent video, it, it didn't go into too much detail. But in that article, you highlighted how UNRWA applies a different standard of policy for the for the Palestinian camps. Um, versus the standard policy of the UN High Commission. How is it handled differently in Judea and Samaria compared to the way that the UN handles it there's across the globe? Night day. Around the world, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees works very hard to resettle refugees, including Arab refugees who are left in 
in Iraq after the after Saddam Hussein fell. I sent a journalist to Chile to see the the uh, the, the absorption facilities there. How they were they're taken in for life, as opposed to here where they're they're in refugees for perpetuity. And when it's it's hysterical because it's called temporary the, the refugee camps are called temporary refugee camps. Temporary since 1949. It's ridiculous. And uh, the and um, there's no and to to even mention anything having to do with um, uh, with the permanent resettlement. That's that's a capital crime. And that's very important. People don't know that. So not a, not a double standard at all. <laughs> There's one standard. Copy. I'd also like to get some of your thoughts on uh, the ridiculous executive order that was recently published by the current U.S. administration. Um, right. And written by various Jewish organizations who, uh, who are convinced that um, the people in Judea, Samaria are conducting, conducting war crimes. If it, the, it's basically copy-paste from four Jewish organizations, Americans for Peace Now, J Street, um, Israel Policy Forum, and uh, one more, I'll think in a second. But they're, they're, they, from, it's a political uh, political point of view from the Biden administration trying to woo, to woo Jewish liberal groups who are convinced that we're monsters in Judea Samaria. And that's, the, that's, we, that's what... We that's might what be doing. in a presidential election year. How about that? Does Biden know what day it is? But uh, he may know what year it is. I'm sure his staff does. It really does seem like a major overreaction to issue such an order based on so far sure. only four individuals that have been identified, right? What so, if 400 have been identified? But that's the whole point. They're 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 relying on um, tendentious, crazy reports which have no basis in reality. However, they're marketed as something else. The marketing these guys do. To make the the Jews in Judea Samaria look like criminals is very good. I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it objectively. They know what they're doing. They know how to project an image. And uh, when when people did, when Vietnam went the wrong direction, um, then then projecting the uh, Vietnam the Viet Cong as you know, Sadikim was the what they did. Now in the early '60s, I remember very well. I was a, a young guy, but I remember. The Viet Cong were presented as monsters by 1968. They had enough um, media savvy to present themselves as freedom fighters. In my professional lifetime, I've watched the PLO go from, you know, being projected and correctly projected as, as monster terrorists to reasonable people. The one interview I had with Yasser Arafat, uh, a personal interview with the, you know, I, I was able to get in to see him. Um, I brought a the guy who I, who I brought was who I said was my driver was actually one of the leading body language experts in the world. So I said, "What do you think of him?" He says, "If I didn't know who he was, I would say he was incapable of violence." That was how good his body language was, except when someone disrupted mid sentence and he gave him new body language that he could kill him. But that, and the previous time I had contact with Arafat, where we were doing a movie about him. His spokesman said, so you can trust him. He's only killed 12 people with his own hands. So what's what's your opinion on the fact that here in the U.S. we have, um, you know, U.S. code and law that, that prohibits, uh, prohibits us from contributing material support or anything to terrorist organizations or those associated with terrorist organizations? How How is it that we continue to transfer money to Mahmoud Abbas? FATA and the PLO and well, several of those organizations are on a very, the that's a, very, that's, a, that's a, a very soft softball question. The 1993 Oslo process, uh, Oslo Accord, redefined the PLO as a peace partner. Now we had the scoop that no one else had and or has today that the PLO never ratified the accord because we had somebody inside Tunis at the where they were supposed to ratify and they never did. But that was downplayed. Well. Even if they didn't, I mean, there's still organizations well, within then, the PLO. But that again, are on the FTO they, list. Let's, let's make a comparison. My father's best friend at the time was a was a U.S. consul in Nairobi, so he kept saying maybe Arafat will go through a Muhammad uh, <laughs> um, uh, Kenyatta. Maybe he'll become a uh, a Kenyatta kind of a guy. Maybe he'll see the light. 
and that and that in terms of how the people who projected him, the people who who uh, um, over, over, read, read did Arafat in the media in the, in the PR. That's what the, most people think that he went through a, a, a transformation to Jomo Kenyatta, and that was done very professionally. And and I, the only comparison I can think of for my era of life was the it was the, with the PLO with the NLF and how the the marketing of the NLF, the marketing of, of Castro. I mean, did anyone ever see a picture of Che Guevara because he was in charge of the, uh, the, the, um, all the, the uh, fire, firing squads? I never showed, I showed a picture of me. You know, he's, he was on people's t shirts and peace movements. Again, how you market a, an evil person as a good person is part of the story. And that's, I, I, I don't want to say it me. Because there are people of other religious, Jewish religious points of view, I don't want to say how other Jew, parts of Judaism have you know, marked themselves look, look totally legitimate. But that's another story. Today, today as we speak, there are organizations on the FTO list that are receiving U.S. aid. And has anyone objected? Apparently not. No, no. That's the whole point. In Losha, I, I, I studied that for me for the last. At 37 years in Losho Alim in Michigan. If you get you what you have to have a task force, a PLO study task force. Now we put out a book. Okay. This is a book we put out. It's closed um, inside the Palestinian Authority and the, P, the PLO. We put out another book, which I wrote. This is written by one of our staffers, Arlene Kushner, and she was working for us. And we put out another book, which you can get on Amazon called Inside the the uh, on the genesis of the Palestinian Authority. So I get get together a task force to look at what's happening. Have a sprinkle a lawyer here and there, but just you know find out, and, and that has all kinds of implications for it. Because if you have one, well, if you can find one guy who is a um, genuine P Al Aqsa Brigade advocate or graduate, he could be arrested tomorrow morning if he walks around New York, New York blowing his nose. But no one's done. People are much too polite. One of the implications of the war we, we're having right now is there's there's going to be a lot less politeness, a lot less politeness, especially vis-a-vis -vis UNRWA. Now, yours truly was made fun of. People laughed at me for saying yeah, those 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 um, schools are are filled with guns. Well, excuse me, but they are. And asking for a uh, asking the um, American government said, would you please check out those schools? Just check them out, especially in the areas that the army didn't go into. But we do know that the much easier than an easier point, at which I documented in our, in our movies, to join the summer the Palestinian arm arm training summer camp. You can be eight or nine years old. It's fine. But again, no one objects. There we we're in an era of people not, you know, not objecting to those things. But there was some progress rate uh, made, right? I mean, you, for at least for a short period of time, you had the curriculum was was adjusted. Nope, that's another. That's an, that's that, that's a lie. Just a lie. So for so for generations, they've been te teaching one gener hate one violence. generation since August first, two thousand. They've had one curriculum. It's not a hatred. It's a murder. Uh, the Arab psychologist explained to me, "We don't want to. If we want to wipe out a uh, a poisonous snake, we don't hate it. We don't hate him. We just want to kill him." When you look at our movies of the children, then we'll do a fast forward, and it's easy to get the Hitler young in, in the the Hitler youth movie movies, and compare them. The, the kids are not frothing in the mouth saying, "Kill them. Um, We hate the Jews. They frothing in the mouth. We want to kill them. The Jews are no longer human." So now apparently we have uh, the current administration making a list of Jews that live in Judea and Samaria. They're not making the list. The list was already made by the Right of Return Center in London. They've, they've made it. They've, they've, they've um, uh, computerized it. And uh, that it's, all, it's, all, it's all ready. And since the majority of the world defines those of us who live in Judea and Samaria as war criminals, that's very big, but no, Israel's never objected, you see. So your job tomorrow morning is to ask the government of Israel, are you going to are you going to file a complaint 
because of their, their infringing on our sovereignty. See, there's a lot of passivity here which has to be challenged. It takes one person to do that. Just one. Hey, by the way, let me play the devil's advocate with myself. If they were only pushing for Judea Samaria, they'd get it. They're not. I want to be very clear about something. We're in the minority. We have a very bad, bad reputation in Israel as being self-centered. But because they're also talking about the Galil and the Negev and Jerusalem, <laughs> it makes it, it it's it's it, 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 it's good for us. But nobody nobody in Judea in Judea Samaria will admit that because they're focused on themselves. Self, 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 self. That's the whole problem. Jews are under threat everywhere. The, the, the right of return center, the, uh, the right of return center in London, controlled by Hamas, that can be right where every Jew is. Now, the problem we face today is if people heard the trains were coming for them, they would say, what's the kashras on the trains? Are the trains environmentally safe? Is there going to be a mixed minion on the train? Is there going to be a Chabad minion on the train? Is there going to be a, a uh, Karlbach minion on the train? You know, and that's what people would ask. That's the way people think. That. People have been, you know, Whatever. The, the change of what's happened since Sim, the Simchat Torah is that you can see how lethal the situation is. A little bit. So what about uh, of Israel looking to bring in tens of thousands of foreign workers to replace uh, the Palestinians from the West Bank? Well, I, I don't know any bank by that, by that name, but that's okay. Um we, I, I spoke today, I called the spokesman of the Ministry of Absorption today, who's an Ethiopian journalist who I know very well. I said, how about making an effort to promote works, work, work, working, work, work positions for recently arrived immigrants who are, who are unemployed or indigent? By statistical error of 100,000 uh, immigrants who have come in the last five years, there's going to be, it must be 10, 20, 30, 10, 20, 30,000 who would like to just take, take up normal jobs, but they don't know that jobs exist. And Israel got, got addicted to off the, you know, to off the books uh, workers whom you don't have to pay tax for and all kinds of stuff. That has to be the direction, as opposed to bringing Chinese or, or Indians or, I don't know, it can be done. One major reason why we can't bring in the Arabs to work again, one reason, they have a law which I, I'm personally, my office uncovered, publicized, and um, made the world know about as much as we could. There's a law in the Palestinian Authority that if you murder a Jew, you get a salary for life. That's what's called incentivized murder. Every Arab you meet is a, is a potential murderer. Unfortunately, not because he's an Arab, but because he's a citizen of the Palestinian Authority. So we can't have them anymore, unfortunately. I say unfortunately because many of them do good work. Um, the bus, the bus I'm going to take tonight is we have the mostly Arab driver, Arabs are drivers in, in Judea Samaria. They're very pleasant, very good, very good, very good, very polite. By by traveling with him, I'm taking my life in my hands. And since I I, I made a movie called For the Sake of Nakba. If you look for the sake of Nakba and write the Center for Nearest Policy Research, you'll see it. We interviewed about 30 killers. It all matter of fact. Talking about, you know, with them going to murder a Jew is like, you know, a cakewalk or, you know, ice cream break. You, you can't just take weapons away? That doesn't work? No, you take them away. Anyone who has a, has a, has a criminal record and uh, anyone who will say very openly that he'll be, obey the Palestinian law, he has to be kicked out. Right, because if you take away their guns, they'll use knives. And if you take that away, then they'll just run over your children with their vehicle. Or with their with their hands, or with their hands. When you have an intent, this is their, their, this is unprecedented that there would be a law that if you murder a Jew, you get a salary for life. That's never happened before anywhere in civilization. And that's on the books today. Well, I'm the guy who you look at them on my website under the word incentive. You'll see it. We're the ones who got the law. How did we get? Because we hired an Arab journalist to go inside the Palestinian Ministry of Justice and got the computerized. Um, disc with the we got the disc out and uh, we publicized this. My okay. daughter's best friend who was murdered. Okay. Her name was Dalia Lamkus. We went to high school together and they were very good, very good friends. And um, 
above the picture, I have a picture of the murderer as he came into court and he was, his family whispered, whispered, whispered to him, your, your money has just come through. First payment for the rest of your life. Look at that smile. Look at her smile. This is before she was murdered. This is after he was awarded. Okay. Now, you, 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 you put that out. And again, he, he slit her throat. And then when, he, when he, no, he, he ran her over. And then when he saw she was still palpitating, he slit her throat. And um, he's, he's sitting for life in jail. On the other hand, he could be he could he could be one of the people exchanged now for one of the hostages. Again, this is not perfect perfect state. Okay. Now all of a sudden it, it's okay. It's the best uh, policy to negotiate with. Well, with it, terrorists it, it, and hostage takers is. Here's the here's the way the, the 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 key moment of change came when Perez wrote a book called The New Middle East. And uh, in, in that in that new Middle East, everything's going to be different now. We're going to be, we're, we're going to beat the beat our plowshares into investment file in, investment portfolios, and we're going to have a different situation where this the, the he imagined that the guy who instead of placing a bomb bombs on cars he would be uh, fixing a motorcycle that type of thing. The illusion that if you get it, you have a, a guy has a, be a better economic circumstance, that he'll be a better better person, and that's what Paris sold to a whole world of, of, of Jews. And I'd like to do a new movie, composite film of all the incitement over a period of for ten years to show that it was whatever. I don't have any money to work with because the, the dumb people I work with. Oh, everyone knows, people don't know. That's, Is this that's the? Is this the the road to October that you were talking about? Mm -hmm. The road to October seven, yes. So people have to know, and uh, the rest of Israel has to know that they're all under siege. And the reason why it's not being stopped is because UNRWA is a very good customer. And look on the first first article on my website today: four hundred Israeli corporations selling their products to UNRWA and to the PA. Money talks, and you know what. Walks. Okay. All right, my friend. All right. Thank you. The media wants to spin the news and have you believe that the current issues in UNRWA are isolated events relating to just a handful of employees, when in reality, the, the corruption within the agency is systemic and has been ongoing for decades. Please remember to head over to Israel Behind the News and help support David's work as they're preparing to ramp up production for a brand new documentary covering the events leading up to the October 7th attack. You can also find David over at cfnepr.com. I trust our discussion with David today was a blessing. We look forward to seeing you on the next podcast. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the IDF and pray for the release of every single hostage.